It is my pleasure now to introduce uh, Chrissy Doyle Thomas, who's a postdoctoral fellow working with Dr. Ebdekia and Ignasto in the Autism Research Center at Holland Bloorview. I know many of you know uh, Dr. Ebdekia and Ignasto, who is a rising superstar in the field of autism, and we're uh, delighted she's a scientist here at BRI. So Chrissy has completed her PhD in medical sciences at McMaster University, evaluating neural networks in autism spectrum disorders. And at BRI, she continues to explore brain morphology and physiology of ASD. Welcome, Chrissy. Okay, good morning, everyone. So I'll start off by talking a little bit about the neurobiology of autism spectrum disorders. Atypical brain development has been suggested in autism spectrum disorders. In a paper published in 2001 that looked at total brain volume in individuals with autism and typically developing individuals between the age of 2 to 16, we found that there's an, they found that there's an early period of overgrowth between the ages of 2 to 4 years of age. After that, it's followed by an arresting growth and then a plateauing and possible decrease in total brain volume. At this level of anatomy, it's difficult to know what may be contributing to these atypicalities. So other studies have looked at gray matter volume, and these data collectively has shown, have shown that gray matter volume in frontal and temporal lobes of the, brains are, of the brain is particularly increased in individuals with ASD. This is interesting because these are the lobes of the brain that are implicated in social cognition and other behaviors that could be atypical in ASD. What is still unknown, however, is what components of gray matter volume contribute to these atypicalities, how they change with age, and how they're associated with clinical impairments. In a study we published earlier this year, we looked at cortical thickness, which is one contributor to total to gray matter volumes, and we looked at how it changed with age and how it was related to symptomatology. Cortical thickness can give us an indication of many columns in the cortex. In the cortex, cells are arranged, arrange themselves in columns, communicate with cells in that column, and also, re and also receive information from cells in neighboring regions. These columns look very different across development. In this panel A, we see this is 18 weeks gestation. Across here, we see 28 weeks gestation. This is a four-year-old, and this is a, from a 50-year-old. So across development, they look different. This data is received from, post, from analysis done in postmortem tissue. However, cortical thickness is a measure we can do in vivo that can point us to some atypicalities at this level. So we did a cross-sectional design, we used a cross-sectional design in 53 participants. 28 participants were ASD participants and 25 were typically developing individuals. The age span was between 7 to 39 years of age. Both groups were matched on age and full-scale IQ. This is a data slide, sorry, this is an analysis slide that's, that's quite involved, but I would like to just point out that we used a three Tesla magnet and the analysis was sent through an automated pipeline called CIVIT, which is generated by one of our collaborators. So for cortical thickness measurements, we took the T1 weighted image. We then classified it into gray and white matter. The gray matter and the white matter surfaces were extracted, and the distance between these two surfaces were calculated to determine cortical thickness. To orient you to this slide in column A, we have within group analysis for our ASD participants. In column B, we have the control participants within group analysis. And in column C, we have the between group results. The colored version, the colors on these gray brains show regions of significant developmental change across time. The red on, the, on these brains show regions where ASD individuals have have significantly thicker cortices compared to controls. So typical developmental tells us that co the cort cortical thickness should be decreasing with time. Therefore, the cortex should be getting thinner. 
In ASC, we see less change, and this is significantly different when we look between groups. Being interested in social cognition, we then drew ROIs and looked at specific regions that may be implicated <clears throat> excuse me, in, in social behavior. We correlated thickness in these regions with social scores on the autism diagnostic interview revised, which is a diagnostic measure used clinically. <clears throat> excuse me. We found that greater thickness or increases in cortical thickness was more related to poorer scores on this measure. So in summary, when looking at cortical thickness, one component of gray matter volume, <coughs> excuse me, we find that when we look across the brain, we see widespread age-related differences. Greater cortical thinning was seen in controls. This is relative to the individuals with ASD. And in specific social brain areas, we found that atypical cortical thickness was associated with, social, with impaired social function. We then looked at cortical surface area, which is another component of gray matter, gray matter volume. And this shows us a little bit about the neuron count as well as neuron size. And again, from analysis done in postmortem tissue, we see that individuals with autism have a greater number of neurons, particularly in frontal brain regions. Again, surface areas is a measure that we can do in vivo that can point to these atypicalities at the cellular level. In this very similar group, we had 52 participants, 27 individuals with ASD and 25 controls. Again, the age span was the same, seven to 39, and the groups were matched on age and full-scale IQ. The first four steps of pulling out our surface area measures were the same. The last step, however, we pulled out the surface area of eight regions of interest. And this is what we were limited by in the, in, the, in the automated software. Because again, we were interested in social cognition, we paid close attention to these three ROIs, the anterior cingulate in orange, the posterior cingulate in green, and the insula. All three regions are implicated in social function. When we look at our ASD group, <coughs> depicted here in pink, in the anterior cingulate and posterior cingulate, we see that they start off with greater surface area and it decreases with age. This is different from our control group that shows little to no change across age. Again, looking at, into, uh, again, looking at social brain areas and its relation to social scores and the ADIR, we found that increased surface area was related more to poorer scores on the ADIR. So in summary, in social brain areas, such as the anterior and posterior cingulate, we found that greater surface area decreased with age in individuals with ASD relative to controls where little change was seen. In the insula, greater surface area was associated with poorer social function. So in summary, cortical thickness and surface area, two determinants of gray matter volume that we found are also atypical in ASD. These measures give us our in vivo measures that can point to potential atypicalities at the cellular level. In the absence of access to large quantities of postmortem tissue, which sometimes are complicated by causes of death and me other medical uh, complications that are independent of ASD, these measures can bring us closer to identifying neural targets in vivo that, con can that contribute to larger scale gray matter changes. The present findings suggest that potential underlying atypicalities are found in the mini column organization, as well as in the number and maybe size of neurons in the brains of individuals with ASD. And this may be caused by neural challenges in the autistic brain that prevents the pruning away of unwanted cells and connections based on experience and learning. So there are some limitations to our studies. As I mentioned before, this is a cross-sectional design, which is a proxy for longitudinal design, which is better suited to look at developmental change across time. It's a, a relatively small sample, and we're limited to only properties of the, cort of the cortical mantle. However, future directions could be 
to replicate this study in a larger sample using a longitudinal design, and also to continue to characterize neural and behavioral differences in individuals with AST to better target these atypicalities with psychopharmacologic interventions. Both of these uh, future directions we're currently doing in, with a grant, under a grant that we, got, that we received, that allows us to collect data in up to 2,000 kids with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, including autism. And lastly, we can work collaboratively with experts in histology methods to investigate potential contributions at the cellular level to abnormal cortical thickness and surface area. I'd like to thank my mentor, uh, Dr. Evdakia Niknostu, another mentor of mine, Dr. Margot Taylor at the at Hospital for Sick Children, and our collaborators here at Holland Bloorview uh, Sick Kids and in Mount Sinai, New York. Thank you. <laughs>